I had this thought come to me uh, just this week in, in preparation for today, and I'm just going to jump ahead of myself and, 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 and mention this thought that just seemed to gr- uh, grab my attention. And it was this thought. Do you think this is Job's first trial? Probably not. I mean, this is like, this is a trial. What what Job goes through in chapter 1 and chapter 2, what he goes through, in fact, between chapter 1 and chapter 2, it's almost like there's a little little rest before the second round. It's kind of like the the, uh, the, the center of a, of a hurricane, the eye wall. You know, you're inside, you're in this safety zone. Anybody that's ever lived through a, a hurricane knows there's the first round. And if you're in the eye wall, there's a, a space, a time where it's a beautiful day. And then within just a short amount of time, you're back to the second half. And that's chapter one and chapter two of Job's life. And, and, and he, you can tell when he writes this book, he's been through some things. And my guess is, in how he responds to this test, this trial, it's not his first time. In fact, it just, it just dawned on me, most likely he's been through this a number of times, and he's learned each time to trust God and obey God, even to the point when this kind of a test comes, he knows what to do. As we looked at last week, when we began this little mini-series, we looked at last week, look at the end of chapter 1. Um, it says in verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Let me, let me tell you, say something. Our typical human response to a trial or test is not to worship God. That, that's not natural. Our natural response is to uh, cry, to get angry, uh, to blame somebody, and then ultimately the enemy would love for us to be in a position where we blame God. That, that, that would be the, the enemy's desire. In fact, we see that here in chapter 1 and 2, and next week we're going to cover this, how it's, it's the enemy, it's Satan's goal to try to get you, a child of God, to question God and even blame Him. That's his motivation. And God, God desires for us to trust and obey Him no matter what the circumstances of life may be. And so, as Pastor Perks mentioned a minute ago, there really is a spiritual battle going on for your mind, for your heart, what you're going to believe, what you're going to love, what you're going to adhere to and, and follow after with your heart. There truly is a spiritual battle taking place. But this, I, my guess is, it doesn't state this, unless I see something later on, it's like, oh, he indicates it. But this is probably not his first trial. Thankfully, thankfully, God is gracious to us, and it promises us over there in 1 Corinthians 10, he'll never suffer us to be tempted above that we are able, and I'll, I'll put some, uh, my own words in at the end, to trust him with. Sometimes, sometimes people think that, you know, uh, God, will, God will only give me what I can handle. That, that, is, that is worldly philosophy. It is, it, is God's, it is God's intention for us when we are tried or tested to find our strength in Him, not self. And so that is, that is one of the reasons why God is doing this. He starts us out small, and, the, and we learn to trust and obey God in a small trial or a small test, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger. The answer always remains the same. Amen? We've, we've talked about that before. God's tests are always have the same answer. Different questions, different circumstances, but always the same answer. And with that, you can do well in school, amen? If, it was, if the same test had the same answer, just a different question, hey, I can pass this test. And the same is true with every trial or test we face. The answer is always the same, therefore we can pass it. But it just requires us to trust and obey. Last week we began with this question of how many times in life have you been tempted to blame God? And I know some of us will say, oh, I would never do that. (laughs) Well, have you ever? And if you haven't, the day may come when you will. And we know that's not the right answer, but the temptation exists, and the enemy would love to, to just press us to the point where we would even entertain such an accusation. It would be a false accusation, but that's where it could go. 
We learned last time, we talked about the source of difficult times, whether it's the consequences of my own sin or the consequences of other people's sin. Sometimes it's just the consequences of human degeneration in this world, or it's the result of an enemy that's really trying to get you. You have an adversary that would love to get you to turn your heart against God. Now, we know that God is sovereign. He's in control, and He either causes or allows everything in our lives. And we have Romans 8, 28 to always look back to and be thankful for because there are many times in the Christian life, at least for me, where that, that, even this last week, where I had to quote that verse to myself. I had to counsel myself and say, it's still in the book that all things work together for good. Because there are times when the circumstances and the situations, you're like, this seems hopeless. This seems like there's no end to it. It's going to get worse and worse. And what are we going to do? But God, God is in control. And if he didn't cause it, he allowed it, which still shows us he is in control. And so whenever, with with this truth in mind, it's never right to blame God for anything negative in our lives. God, God cannot sin. God is good. He does not harm people. We may, we may bring in, I mean, oh, go back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve chose to sin against God. Yes, Eve was deceived. Adam chose. It seems like he knowingly and willingly chose to sin against God. As a result, God had to judge. But that's not God doing harm to people. That is God simply being just. You say, that doesn't make any sense. God is a holy God. He is so holy that any Sin. Say, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of God's laws. I mean, God, God gave a simple command in Genesis 2. Hey, you can eat of any, tree of the, uh, any fruit of the tree of, uh, in the garden, anything. But there's one tree, you cannot eat of it. I mean, that, I mean, that seems so simple. People today want to make out like sin is no big deal. Oh, that's just a little sin. What did Adam and Eve do? <laughs> All they did was eat a piece of fruit. What's wrong with that, Right? I mean, if we want to say that, that sin's no big deal, well, God was certainly offended by it. God was certainly just in judging that sin, and you and I are reaping the consequences of it thousands of years later. You say, well, why is God so harsh? You don't understand. God is that holy. And if we can, if we can wrap our minds around the reality that God is that holy, that even little sins are, are an offense unto him, then we're going to arrive somewhere in our thinking. But if we follow the world's thinking, which says, ah, oh, that's no big deal. And, and as time goes on, I mean, if you're, uh, where's Jaya? Jaya I'll, I'll use a phrase for Jaya. She loves when I talk about being north. If you're north of me in age, all right? If you're north of me, you remember when, when there were some sins that were just seemed like, oh, no one would dare do that in society. And then in my generation, it was like, okay, we'll tolerate this. And then now we've got a couple more generations beneath me. And now it seems like anything goes. In fact, the only thing wrong today is to say that something is wrong. Well, let me say this. God has not changed. God is still holy. The things that offend God 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 100 years ago, the same sins still offend God. And that's between you and God to get resolved. I didn't write the book. I'm just here to proclaim it. Proclaim what God has said. God is a holy God. He cannot sin. He will always do right. Always. He's always good. He may judge because He is holy, but He will always do right. He will always do good. So in this little mini-series, We're going to be looking at some lessons for life. And today I have a a, a lesson uh, for life, and that's this. Trials reveal the treasure of our heart. Trials will, will boil out and reveal to us and show to us what we truly treasure in our heart. And ultimately, we want to get to the place like Job where God himself is our chief treasure. And, when, and when, there's, when, the Lord is, when the Lord is our treasure, 
when the Lord is, every other thing that we use to treasure is going to take its proper place in life. Because sometimes, sometimes our treasures are out of place, they're out of order. Maybe we're elevating people above God. Maybe we're elevating self above God. Maybe, maybe we have things in the wrong place. And God wants us to rearrange things in our hearts to the point where we'll never blame God. And I've never, I've never met anyone, including self, I've never met anyone that's had it worse than Job. You read chapter one, chapter two, it ought to encourage you when whatever we're going through, it's like, well, it could be worse. And look at the example he lays out before us that he has God as his treasure. Let's look at verse one, uh, Job chapter one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household. So that is, this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. And so we begin uh, this chapter by looking at the treasure of Job's heart. And I see two treasures and, and, and they're the, the best treasures to have in life. And the first we'll look at is his relationship with God. And secondly, his relationship with people. And we'll see it with his family. But we begin with their chief treasure. And, and this is hard for some people to understand. But God, we ought to love God more than family. Family second. And the rest is details. The rest is, is, is extra. And I think there ought to be a proper ordering. But God ought to be our chief love in life. Because if we don't have a proper love for God, we'll not have a proper love for anyone else or anything else. And so we've got to love God first. And that is what Job is teaching us, that God is the treasure of his heart. And then family comes second. And this is so important. Let's look at, first of all, his relationship with God. Job is clearly a faithful man. And we say a faithful man, we mean someone who has faith in God. What is faith in God? It's having confidence in the character of God. And Job, Job is exactly that. He is one that has absolute confidence in the character of God. You're going to see this theme throughout the book. That he, he even said at one point, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And God, God uses trials and tests to produce that kind of confidence in his character. Why? Because we go through a small test and we realize, I can trust God with this. And God answers. God provides. God fulfills. God, God solves the issue. God meets the need of our heart over this thing. And then we go a little longer in the Christian life and we're growing and maturing. And, and now a new circumstance, a new trial, a new test comes. And you recall the one when you were a, a babe in Christ. And now you realize, wait a minute, if I use that same reality of trusting God's character, because I trusted him last time and look what he did for me. I'll be doing that again. And so we employ that same faith and that keeps growing and growing. You look at the life of Abraham and you can trace in the book of Genesis and in the book of Romans the development of Abraham's faith. He wasn't perfect in faith. Noah, none, none of these Bible uh, heroes uh, were perfect in faith from the word go. They were tried. They were tested. They made decisions with their heart, with their mind, just like you and me. And we too, we too need to be tested to learn to trust God's character. And that's what we see with Job, a faithful man. He, before the trial, he trusted and obeyed God. And so that during the trial, he trusted and obeyed God. And by the way, whatever we are, however we are with God before a trial is how we'll be during the trial. Our initial response is, is going to be how we are with him prior. They say, they say it's nothing like a, an emergency 
or a trial or some kind of a pressing upon our lives to reveal what's really in our hearts. <laughs> and if you're like me, it's oftentimes not pretty. It's like, man, I thought I, thought I was more mature than I really am. And now I realize I'm not. This trial, this, this scenario, this situation has revealed a, a, a deeper layer of sin than I even knew was in my heart. There are some things in my heart that are ugly and things that are sinful that need to be rooted out of my heart. And oftentimes trials will do that. And so how I am before is how I'll be during. And, and this thing may be used of God to, to weed out and root out some things that don't belong in my heart. God may be simply using it to increase our faith. Maybe, maybe as like with Job, one of the main principles being established in the book of Job is that God is not judging him. Job had three friends, right? And these three friends, you'll learn about them as we go forward. One of the things they're trying to do is get Job to confess his sin. I mean, Job, I mean, certainly God is judging you. <laughs> it's so clear and obvious. This has to be the judgment of God because no one's been through what you're going through. There must not just be a little sin. There must be some huge sin, Job, that you've got to get right with God. But the thing the book of Job is teaching us is he's not being judged for sin. He's being tried to increase his faith. And so depending on what's going on in a man's heart or a woman's heart, and between them and God, they know whether this is a, a, an obedience thing or a, a faith thing, or maybe it's a combination of both. But trials, trials reveal what we are truly trusting, what we are truly loving. It reveals what truly is the treasure of our heart. And it boils down to this. Either the Lord is our treasure or something else is the chief treasure, the number one treasure. And God, God, is, God is so good. I mean, what, what's the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, right? That, that is the, the chief uh, commandment. It's the main thing. In essence, it's what life is all about that, that we would love God, that we would be committed. And I'm not talking about having, not even about the emotional side of it. That's a, a byproduct of the commitment, right? Real love is commitment, not emotion. Emotion is the byproduct of real commitment. And so when we are committed to God above everything else, including self, which is our greatest challenge in 2024, the love of self, if, if we would put God ahead of self, He is my chief treasure. That he, I am committed to Him above anyone else, especially self. That's commitment. That's love. And if that is not the case, God just may allow or cause a trial, a test in our lives to bubble out an idol, some misplaced trust, some misplaced love, boil out a trial. I'll give you an illustration, and some of you sports fans will understand this. I had an idol in my life, my football team. God allowed me to lose four Super Bowls in a row to humble me and weed out of my heart an idol. And, and if God did that for me, so be it, you know. All, all those Buffalo fans can, can hunt me down and let me have it for saying such things and having such things in my heart. But you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, sometimes we let a sports team become what we're committed to the most. Sometimes it's a human being. Sometimes it's a job. Sometimes it's money. So, I mean, you name it. There's all these potentials. It's self. There's all these things that we can be committed to above God. And God will use a trial or a test to weed that thing out of your heart whereby we say, hey, it's not worth it. That, th that thing is not worth the commitment of my heart. It's not worth the focus of my heart. He ought to be my chief treasure. He ought to be the one. And trials will do that. Either the Lord is my treasure or it's something else. And God wants to weed that out of our hearts. So take a look at this man's life, Job's life. It says there in verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. 
He talks about him being a perfect and upright man. This is what I would call faith in action, faith in life. He's living out what he believes. Because, he, because the Lord is his treasure, he lives out what he believes about God, what he knows to be true about God, and what God wants for him in his life. And that word perfect, don't, don't uh, misunderstand what the word perfect means in the English language. You know, as all languages uh, change over time, when the Bible was translated back in the 1600s, it was when English was at its best. And the word perfect simply means complete, not flawless. Because there's no human being, including Job, that is flawless. It just means he's complete. So well, what, do you, what does that mean by being complete? Well, look at 1 Timothy. Thinking about that word perfect and being complete. The word means lacking nothing. And a, a perfect man is one who is, who is lacking nothing. He has everything that he needs. You say, well, <laughs> who's got everything they need? Well, it depends on what our definition of needs and wants is as to whether or not we will be perfect or, or complete. In, in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, if you look down to verse number 6, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, so here's this call for us to be godly with contentment. Well, content about what? Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. <laughs> so in other words, anything that's temporal... Anything that's physical, whether it be a house, a car, uh, money, uh, you you name it, anything temporal, you're not leaving this world with. Okay, they can load your coffin up with all those things. It's it's not going with you. We brought nothing into this world, as certain we carry nothing out. Verse 8 says, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Hmm. Hmm. If I can learn to be content with having food for today and clothes on my back, I, I should be content. And godliness with contentment, you'll find great gain. Great gain in what? In riches? Not necessarily. But in the true riches. Where God is our riches, Christ is rich. We can be rich in the Lord, rich in faith, rich in obedience, rich in the spiritual realm, but not necessarily in the physical realm. And if we can arrive at this place where we are content, he says in verse verse 10, it says, for the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through many sorrows. Money is not wrong to have money. But the love of money is sin. It'll destroy your heart. And I've met, I've met people that have no money, but they love money. And I've met people with lots of money and they love money. And both, both are miserable. And I've met people that have no money and are content. And people with lots of money and are content. And they're both joyful in the Lord. So it's not how much we have that produces joy. It's about our view of the Lord and our, who cares about the rest? Now, I understand you've got to have money to pay the bills. I understand that. But this is about contentment in our heart. Are we content? When it says that Job was a perfect man, I believe the Bible is saying that God is saying, and by the way, this is what God said. God said that about him. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? This is back in Job 1, verse 8. It says, There is none like him in the earth. God said that about Job. Hey, there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. In other words, God is saying about Job is that Job is lacking nothing. Now, we're going to see, we already read the verse, I think it's verse 4, there's 3, 4. Job had a lot of possessions. He was a rich man, more the riches than anyone in the East. And they say the East is that probably modern day Iran, the, the Persian region. Probably he lived out that way. But of of all the people that lived east, that direction, there was no one like him. He he was a rich man. He had all these possessions, and yet he did not allow that to cloud his love for God. He was a perfect man. He was content, not because of what he possessed, but because of what he possessed. Because he knew Christ, because he was a, a man that loved God, he was a perfect man. And oftentimes in trials, 
One of the things that God wants to teach us is that He is all that we need. Look at the book of James with me. James chapter 1. In, in trials and tests, one of the things that God wants to accomplish in our hearts is for us to realize He is all that we need. He's all that we need now. He's all that we need during the trial, after the trial. Sometimes, you ever, you ever hear these stories? I've, I've seen it even on television. One of my favorites was a man caught in a hurricane, <clears throat> I think on the Florida coast, and the, the uh, no, excuse me, it was a tsunami somewhere uh, in Asia. And the guy, the guy was, remember that tsunami in Thailand 10, 15 years ago, something like that? I think this is where that was from. The guy was able to climb a tree uh, to get above the, the rising, you know, when a tsunami happens, the water gets really low, and then it comes in really high. And then it goes back out. He was able to climb a tree and survive in that, the tsunami in a tree, and he lived. It stayed, it's, the tree stayed upright through the tsunami. But he promised God, and he gave a testimony to this afterwards, he promised God that if God got him through that, then he'd really live for God because he hadn't been. And you hear stories like that. People that are in a, in a deep trial, and they make these vows. God, if you'll get me, kind of like Jonah, right? Jonah. God, if you, you know, I, if, if we're ever in that situation, I mean, if that's what God uses to smack us around and say, hey, you better, you better get right with me. Then, then praise God, but God brings you through. Get serious. Fulfill your vow. Do what you said. But here's the thing. We don't have to go through a tsunami or something to make that decision, to be committed to God. We don't have to go through those depths. We don't have to. I mean, whatever God has to use, that, that's up to you. How, how, how severe it needs to be. But if we will just make that decision, no, I want to live for God. I want, to, I want to walk with God. I, I want to obey God. But even then, God still wants to test us. But it is interesting how God will use these trials to get us to realize that He is all that we need. James 1 verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And you scratch your head and you say, James, why would you say that? What do you mean, count it all joy? Not, not for the trial, not for the temptation, but for the result of the temptation, for the fact that it's going to bring you close to God and teach you to trust and obey. Count it all joy. Verse 3 says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Ah, oh, Job, a perfect man. James, he understood this. How can we be complete and perfect when God is all that we need? We're complete. We sing that song, Complete in Thee. When we are, when we are content, when we are satisfied with God and God alone, we'll be content. We, we, we will be perfect. We'll be complete. That's Job. How did Job get there? Probably what James said. He went through trials and tests and gets to this ultimate one and passes. Now, he goes through a lot. He's got uh, 40, 39 chapters of in between chapter 2 and chapter 42. And, I, and I like I said last week, I love chapter 42. If you want to see the end, go ahead, jump ahead, read 42, because that's the blessing. But between chapters 3 and, and, and uh, chapter 41, there's, there's a lot that goes on. It's a hard, deep trial. But once again, Job knows God's the answer. God is the one. He is complete. He's upright. He says he was a perfect and an upright man. That word upright means someone who lives according to what is right? When we say that someone's an upright and upstanding citizen, you know, that means, you know, upright. He's, he's not into anything low and, and crooked and, and, and devious. He's an upright man. He's doing that which is right in the eyes of God. Amen? It's not enough to do right in the eyes of man because what man thinks is right is always shifting and changing. 
what, we, what our society thought was wholesome and right 30 years ago is no longer the case. We keep lowering the standard. Now it's, now it's you do whatever you want. Just don't harm anybody. I hear that a lot. Oh, that's not sin as long as nobody's getting harmed. Even in my generation, it was the mentality was, hey, whatever you do behind closed doors, who cares? As long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And now you can do whatever you want as long as no one gets hurt. That's, that's the new standard. That's, that's the world's, so that's man's standard. Then we've got to define what harming someone means. Because what one person's definition of harming someone is different from the next person's. And that's where we have all these problems. But if we go back to what God says is right, life goes well. We've got to choose God's way. And Job was that kind of man. He lived according to what is right. He was a man of integrity, doing what is right even when no one is watching. That's, that's, that's the best definition of integrity I've ever heard in my life. It's doing what is right when no one's watching and when you know no one is watching because you know God's watching. And you're not living to please man. You're not looking to put on a show before man. You want to please God. And when He is the treasure of our heart, that's who we want to please. You'll know what you treasure in your heart by who you choose to please in life. And Job was a man that wanted to please God. Look at Psalm 57 with me. I'm reminded of this Psalm of David when he describes the the decision of his heart. Psalm 57 In verse 7, it says this, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. And you want to talk about a man who went through some trials? In fact, if you look at the, the, the superscript of this psalm, it says to the chief musician, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Here, here's David, a younger man, who has been anointed by God to be the king, but Saul hasn't stepped down yet. Saul lost the kingship. He hasn't stepped down. In fact, he gets jealous over David's uh, victories, over the, the, the societal shift to allegiance to David, even though Saul's still king. They're singing their songs about David, not about Saul anymore. And his pride stepped up, Saul's pride. And and he gets jealous and angry with David and tries to kill him and ends up hunting him for a long time. Well, welcome to the kingship, David. David went through some trials. David went through some testings. And he says here in verse 7, when he fled from Saul in the cave, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. Verse 11, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. This is while he's uh, being hunted. Wow, what a test. And what a response. And perhaps David looked to Job as his example. And you know what? Job went through a lot. You ever think about that? David thinking about Job. I'm sure he had access to the book. I learned from Job, David would say, I learned how to respond to a trial and to a test. And he had his heart fixed upon God. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, God says a trying of our faith is more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know know what God is pleased by? You know what's precious in the eyes of God? When you and I live by faith, when we trust his care, I mean, as a human, as a human being, when someone, when someone trusts me, that, that means a lot to me. How about you? Someone trusts you in business. Someone trusts you in life. They, hey, can you, can you keep a secret? Hey, can you watch this thing for me? Hey, can you, and, and someone trust, you appreciate that, right? Does it make you, make you feel good, feel, feel appreciated when someone can trust you? And when, when we can trust God, I believe God's heart is pleased. It's precious to Him when we simply trust His character. And He tests us, and it's worth it. Job had this great relationship with God where he would fear God. In fact, look at Psalm, while we're in the Psalms, look at Psalm 112. He, 
Job had a fear of God. And here in the Psalms, we see a reference to fearing God and the, the importance it is of, of fearing God. What does it mean to fear God? It means to have reverence and respect for who he is. It says in Psalm 112, verse 1, Praise you the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Uh, verse number 7 says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed Trusting in the Lord, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. This is, this is the confidence a child of God can have when he has a fear of God. When we fear God, when we have respect and reverence, when he is our, our chief treasure. It says, blessed, verse 1, that means, oh, how happy is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. By the way, uh, if you look over in the Proverbs, one of, the, one of the ways you'll know that you fear God is when you keep His commandments. If I, if I really respect God, if I really have a reverence for God, if I really have a love for God, I'm going to obey what He says. But when I have too much respect and reverence for self or this world, then I say, sorry, God, I'm going to go do what's popular. I'm going to go do what pleases me. Okay, then I'm, I have the fear of me. Or the fear of man. And those two things are nothing compared to the fear of God. Fear of man brings a snare. Fear of man will make us miserable. Fear of self will be miserable. But the fear of God gives delight. The fear of God is a joyful place. And it's clear that Job had a fear of God. Look at in the book of Job in chapter 28. Job 28. This is what the Bible's saying about Job's life. In Job 28, if you look down to verse 28, and he says, Unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Wow, the fear of the Lord, that's wise. If that's your, if that's the, and no, no one can make you no one can decide this for you. This is a decision of your heart whether or not you're going to fear God or not. And if you do, that's wisdom. It means you're wise. It's the, it's the very first step of wisdom is to fear God. And to depart from evil, that means you get it. You know, when I got saved, nobody had to tell me Oh, don't do this, and don't do that, and oh, don't do that over there, and don't do that. No one had to do that. When I got saved, I had a fear of God. I don't want to do those things. If God says it's wrong, I don't want to do it. Why? Because I spent the first 20 years of my life doing what I wanted, and it yielded nothing for me. I was miserable and empty. Even tried religion for a year. That didn't work. But when God saved me, when I came to Christ in repentance and faith at 20 years of age, no one had to tell me, do this, don't do that. I just knew from the word of God and the spirit of God within, and I don't want to do sin. If that's sin, I don't want it. Why? I fear God. Job was a man that feared God. You can look at Proverbs 8, 13, 16, 6, 19. There's so many verses on the fear of the Lord that we could spend another three messages, but we won't do that. It says of Job, he was a man that was perfect and upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. The word eschewed means to turn aside, to depart, to abstain from, to shun, to purposely avoid. And so we see, we see he had a love for God by his obedience, by his fear. By his confidence. Job's chief treasure was to love God. You say, how did he get that? Because <laughs> Job got a hold of the fact that God loved him. We love him because he first loved us. God committed himself to me. I commit myself back. And when that is the chief treasure of my heart, now we move on to the second chief treasure, the love of people. What's the second great commandment? To love your neighbor as yourself. 
But that's the second one, not the first one. The first one's to love God. And if this one's in place, then this one can be in place. But if this one is not in place, this will never be in place either, as much as you may try. And I know it's, it's, it's kind of trending these days to, to you know, uh, choose love and hate evil. Oh, amen. I agree. But there's this subculture developing in our nation where we're trying to be good people on our own accord. And I'm all for being good. I mean, don't stop. Keep doing what's right. Be against evil and what's wrong. The challenge is, what do we define as good and evil? Because the Bible warns us in the end times, there'll be a shift of that which is called evil is going to be called good, and that which is good is going to be called evil. And so there's a danger. We, we see a shifting, and our society is what, what used to be, according to what God said is evil, society is now calling good, and what used to be good in the eyes of God is now being called evil. And so when they say choose love and hate evil, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Let's define some terms. God's terms are your terms. And so it's a dangerous, a dangerous place, but we still have to choose God first, obey God first, and then secondly, our relationship with people. Look at his family. It says in verse 2, there was born in him seven sons and three daughters, a blessed man, a, a full house. Verse 3 says he had a lot of substance, um, 3,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household because the household would include all of the descendants, his children, their children, if, he, if they were alive at that point. Um, uh, it's referring to the, the staff. I mean, with all those animals, right, uh, Brother Cliff, uh, Alex, right, with all those animals, you need dozens and dozens of help. You need a lot of people. There's no way one person's care. So he had a large household. And so he, Job and his, his household, it was huge. So many people working there and, 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 and helping him with all of these possessions that he had so that he was the greatest of all the men in the East. And so he had a, a great relationship with his family. He had his sons and his daughters, I believe, a great relationship with his household because these people seem like they're there and with him and helping out. And they're blessed. God has blessed them. But I really see his love in action. In verse number 4 and 5, it says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone is day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Say, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing wrong with eating food. Nothing wrong with drinking uh, beverages so long as it's right before God. And so it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be, not saying that it is, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. I see Job as an intercessor. This last Wednesday night I preached a message on intercession and I won't re-preach it. If you want to learn more about intercession, go watch that on YouTube from this past Wednesday. Uh, but we see Job as a great intercessor interceding for his own children. Look at Psalm 106 with me. Intercession is simply going before God on the behalf of someone else. And Job said it may be that in the midst of their feasting, I mean, think about it. You ever, you ever um, have that fear if you grew up with too much money, if you had too much money as an adult and your children grow up with that, that they don't need God. I never wanted to be rich. And of course, that's a relative term. But I grew up in a household where it was week to week. And I'm glad that my children get to experience that as well at times. There have been times where it's not that way, but there are times that it is that way because I don't want my children to think that they don't need God. We do need God. And it may be, it may be that they have in the midst of their reveling and they're having a good time, their party, that they turn their hearts against God. Why? They have all they need. They have all their dad's possessions. They have all their dad's uh, wealth at their disposal, and uh, they don't need God. And, and Job was afraid that they would curse God in their hearts. It says in Psalm 106 and verse 23, Therefore, he, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he should destroy them. This is a reference to the nation of Israel when Moses was an intercessor for the nation of Israel. God was going to judge them. 
and Moses stood in the breach and he stood in the way and influenced God not to judge. And Moses is a great example of intercession. Abraham as well, as we looked at on Wednesday night. But Job also is a man who interceded for his children, for his family. You know, there's a, there's a danger of those that are raised in Christianity. The great danger of growing up in the shadow of a godly father or a godly mother is there's a chance that the child will depart. And I know there's no father that's perfect. There's no mother that's perfect. And I mean perfect as in the flawless kind of perfect, as we use it today, right? There, there's, no, there's no one like that. And at some point, the child has to look past the parents and look to God and Christ Jesus. He is the example we look to. But we find, we find Job as one that loved his children so much that he interceded for them. And just in case, he doesn't know, it says, it may be, not that they did, says, it may be that my sons have sinned. And in case they've sinned, I'm going to go intercede for them. And here's an application for us. When we love God and we love people. Can we not go intercede for them? Can we know? Parents, can we intercede for our children? No matter whether, whether they're following God or not, we ought to be interceding for them. If we love them, we've got to intercede no matter what. I got message, a message yesterday from someone about someone who got saved, someone who was raised in Christianity and departed and got saved. I was weeping. I was rejoicing. Oh, it was, so, it was so glorious to hear. And I know many have interceded for this person. See, as a father, Job could not make his children love his God. Can't make them. <laughs> they have their own free will. They have their own choice. He wants them. It says over in 3 John in verse 4 that there's no greater joy than to hear that your children walk in truth. And I think we can also say there's no greater grief if they don't. But either way, whether they're a chief joy or a chief grief, we've got to be interceding. It may be. And when we love people, we can intercede for people. And it's so clear that Job, he had his treasures right in his heart. He had, he had God first. That was his chief treasure. His family was second. His household and everything else. What's the treasure of your heart? What's your chief treasure? Let's, let's, let's get honest for a minute. What's your, what's your chief treasure? Is it God or is it someone else? And if he is not our chief treasure, when the trials get thick enough, we'll blame God. But if he is our chief treasure, we won't. We'll continue to trust and obey. Just like when they were little, they're getting bigger, they're getting heavier, they're getting closer together. But we know the answer. Is God your chief treasure? Trials will reveal the chief treasure of your heart.